I would like to welcome everyone to Pilgrim's Pipe, Pilgrim Pipelines 101 webinar. I'm here with Kate Hudson, Director of Cross Watershed Initiatives with Riverkeeper, and Jennifer Metzger, Rosendale Town Councilwoman and Co-Director of Citizens for Local Power. We are now going to get started with today's webinar. I'm going to introduce and let them get started. Good evening, and thank you for joining us. Um, to review this uh, very critical uh, and potentially significantly impactful project that has been proposed for uh, a 178-mile pipeline uh, that would run from Albany into New Jersey. Uh, this is our ambitious agenda for tonight uh, to try and uh, lay the groundwork uh, about why um, this proposal is even being made, what is being proposed, what are all the impacts and costs associated with it, um, what is the regulatory process, and what role you and we can play to try and um, uh, work against this uh, project. So the background is uh, the, the uh, fact that there has been a fracking oil boom in the Bakken Shale, uh, which is in the middle section of the country uh, in North Dakota and Canada. Uh, and it increased the amount of oil that was being taken out of the ground 700% uh, in eight years, from uh, 143,000 barrels per day in 2007 to 1.2 million barrels per day in November 2015. Uh, um, and you can see the graph that indicates what a rapid climb we've had. Uh, then the challenge became for the oil uh, producers and the oil owners, how do we get it to some place where we can refine it and sell it? And the answer that they have uh, come up with is primarily been rail shipment. Uh, and again, there's been a 5,000% increase in the number of rail carloads of Bakken crew that has moved across the country. And this uh, map uh, illustrates where it is coming from and where it is going to as far as the East Coast and New York is concerned. Um, and there are two routes, as you can see, that it has taken. Uh, one is north of the Great Lakes and then down through uh, the Adirondack Park along Lake Champlain into Albany. And the other is through uh, south of the Great Lakes through western New York and um, into the Albany area. Some of it does not actually go into Albany. And 25% uh, of the oil coming out of this Bakken region is moving through the New York area by either rail or barge. So here is what we are seeing in the Hudson Valley uh, in New York State. Uh, it is coming down the Hudson Valley um, by both train, oil, the crude oil bomb trains they're called, uh, which are 125 car trains, 3 million gallons of oil per car. Uh, two of these uh, uh, 125 car trains, which are called unit trains, are moving along the west side of the Hudson daily. And uh, in addition, there are there is a barge a day coming down from the Port of Albany, down the Hudson River uh, to uh, New Jersey refineries. And this uh, amounts to about uh, just shy of 5 billion gallons a year, or 10 million gallons per day moving through the Hudson Valley. Uh, just to give you a sense of what oil is going through the Port of Albany uh, versus what oil is uh, traveling south of the Port of Albany, um, there is, uh, there are CSX uh, trains that do not go into the Port of Albany. They go into the Selkirk Rail Yard and they continue down the Hudson River line on the west side of the Hudson. Uh, I'm sure many of you have seen those trains coming down. Um, the the uh, cars that are going into the Port of Albany are being transloaded. The oil on those cars are, trains are being transloaded to tankers and barges that are coming down the Hudson River. What is coming down? Um, at the moment, 
Uh, it is primarily Bakken crude, which is uh, light crude uh, in, in the picture on the left. Uh, it floats, it coats, it's known as a coating crude. It's the kind of crude that coats uh, birds and animals. Um, tar sands crude is a much, much heavier crude. Um, and the uh, transport and loading of that requires either chemical dilution or heating. Uh, and uh, it is significantly uh, destructive in a spill in a water body because it sinks to the bottom and is very difficult to recover. So what are the risks that the Hudson Valley faces today, currently, uh, both communities and the environment? Um, we have seen many train derailments of Bakken crude oil over the United States and Canada over the last several years. And what they've shown us is that they can lead to loss of life, devastating explosions, fires, and large amounts of discharge of oil to adjacent waterways. We've seen waterways on fire. Um, in on a, a spill of Bakken crude oil, uh, and these have occurred, uh, it is, uh, as we said, it's a floating oil. It will spread, particularly in a tidal river like the Hudson. And uh, responders have said that recovering, actually recovering 20 to 25 percent of that oil that is spilled would be considered a successful response. And it's very important to distinguish between responding versus recovering. Uh, with respect to a, a spill of tar sands crude oil, the estimate of what could be recovered in a successful response goes down to 5% of what is spilled, and the rest of it would remain in the environment. And finally, uh, pipeline spill of crude oil or refined products has been seen in other parts of the country, uh, and these spills are frequent, and the spill quantities uh, have been devastating. Um, these pipeline spills tend to uh, release much larger quantities of oil than the train or the vessel spills. Okay, so we're going to now we just kind of set the context both for um, the, the production and, and transport boom in the United States and, uh, and the risks um, to our communities of that. Now we'll talk a little bit about the specifics of the, the proposed Pilgrim pipelines. Um, so this would be uh, actually two parallel pipelines um, that are proposed to connect Albany, New York, um, uh, the Port of Albany to be exact, uh, with refineries in Linden, New Jersey. Um, about 79% of the proposed pipelines uh, are are proposed for the New York State Thruway right-of-way. Um, the remainder um, is proposed to run through private properties and some uh, utility areas. Um, one of these pipelines w uh, is proposed to carry crude oil south from the Port of Albany South uh, to the refineries in and around Linden, New Jersey. The other would carry refined products north um, such as gasoline, kerosene, diesel, and heating oil. Um, it's important to point out that uh, the flows can and have been reversed in pipelines. So, uh, you know, it's theoretically at least both these pipelines could both pipelines could be used to transport crude oil south. Um, each uh, pipeline is 20 inches in diameter, or is proposed to be 20 inches in diameter. Um, with a 200,000 barrels per day carrying capacity, or 8.4 million gallons. Um, in New York, the pipelines would cut through 31 towns, cities, and villages in Rensselaer, Albany, Green, Ulster, Orange, and Rockland counties. Um, the pipelines would also cut through another 30 towns in, in New Jersey across the way. Okay, um, to the, now it's the infrastructure is not just limited to uh, the pipelines. Um, other, other infrastructure include five lateral pipelines along the route connecting to a number of terminals along the way um, that would deliver both, um, both either or uh, crude oil and refined products. Um, and these terminals 
um, are the Buckeye Terminal in Albany, IPT Rensselaer Terminal, um, terminals in the town of Bethlehem, the Buckeye Roseden Terminal, and the Global Newburgh Terminal. And um, these these additional pipelines, um, the longest is, is about seven miles long. In addition, there will be 35 permanent access roads constructed and many, many temporary access roads at one mile intervals along the entire route. Uh, the company is proposing to um, not use the thruway at all for construction or maintenance of the pipeline. This will all be, you know, all um, through local roads, state roads, and then onto the roads that are constructed to serve the pipeline. Um, there are block valves proposed at a maximum of 10 miles apart. And there are four pumping stations proposed, one in Albany, one in the town of East Greenbush, one in the town of Ulster, and one in the town of Woodbury. Um, in addition, during the construction phase, for the duration of the construction phase, um, seven contractor and pipeline yards will be constructed. Okay, we just want to uh, give you a little idea, uh, give you a sense of, of where these pipelines go and what is meant by the right of way. Some people have said to ask me, well, is it, is it the median? Is it the shoulder? Is it, well, it actually, is, the right of way for the throughway runs through farms, woodlands, rivers, wetlands, um, and really through people's backyards, what they think of as their, as their backyards. Um, the, the purple line is the throughway right of way, and the green line is the proposed pipeline path. So as you can see, it runs um, on this slide. This is in the city of Kingston. It runs very close to these uh, residences. Want to just point it? And there are numerous farms located as well along the throughway, um, and as you can see, the right-of-way and pipeline runs through and adjacent to these farms. Okay, so the company, who is Pilgrim Pipeline Holdings, LLC? Um, this company, well, Pilgrim Pipeline Holdings is the parent company based in New Jersey, um, and it has They've established a subsidiary company for New York, Pilgrim Transportation of New York, and these were created for the project. They have absolutely no track record, um, but the company's leadership is drawn from Coke Industries, which is uh, a large conglomerate with pipeline companies that has a pretty checkered past. Um, in January 2000, Coke Industries, Inc. was made to pay the largest civil fine ever imposed under federal environmental law at the time, a $30 million civil penalty um, because of 300 oil spills from its pipelines and oil facilities in six states. The principles of Pilgrim Pipeline, Pilgrim President Errol B. Boyle, former president of Coke Shipping, Inc., Pilgrim Vice President for Operations, Roger L. Williams, former president of Coke Oil Company and former vice president of Coke Industries. The third principal on the team is Pilgrim Vice President for Development, George Bacchus, a former executive and lawyer for a Florida-based real estate investment trust. So these are the people who are going to be making all of the decisions about the construction, operation, and maintenance of these pipelines through New York and New Jersey. So we'd like to um, try and uh, uh, go over some of the claims that Pilgrim makes for why it is that New Yorkers should want this project to be built and uh, reveal the, uh, why these claims have no basis. Uh, their first claim is that the pipelines project would be a safer alternative to rail and barge transport of uh, crude oil and refined product. The fact is, pipelines would involve serious environmental risks and costs to the communities through which they would run. Many of these communities are already exposed to risks and costs from both rail and vessel transport on the, along and in the Hudson River. 
So is there a difference? According to a Forbes article uh, published in 2014, uh, all of modes of transport of crude oil have significant problems. But in particular, pipelines, um, spills are inevitable. There is not a pipeline that has been built that has not um, had some kind of, uh, there has not been an, an ability to build pipelines that would not uh, rupture. And we see that in the evidence of uh, how many times pipelines have spilled and how much oil they've spilled. Uh, the International Energy Administration found that from 20, 2004 to 2012, pipelines spilled three times the oil that oil trains did. Uh, PHMSA, the Pipeline and Hazardous Materials Safety Administration, a federal agency that's charged with overseeing the operation of these pipelines, uh, found that there were um, 1,800, more than 1,800 crude oil pipeline incidents um, on average one every other day during that time period. And the damage and cost that resulted from those spills was um, significant, including 26 fatalities, 56 injuries, $2.5 billion in property damage as a result of the 44 million gallons spilled. And I think most dramatic um, is the fact that newer pipelines have been found to be failing at a higher rate than the oldest pipelines, uh, which uh, debunks one of the claims that uh, the Pilgrim principals have made that their pipeline would not have these problems because it would be a new one. <clears throat> so why aren't pipelines safer? Uh, there are many reasons, um, but in particular, uh, pipeline problems uh, and spills can go undetected. Uh, they're underground, uh, and if they're not being monitored, or are monitored uh, on a real-time basis, spills can go on for days uh, and even longer before they are detected and stopped. As a result, huge quantities of oil can be released. Uh, why aren't these pipeline problems being uh, detected and, and required to be fixed? Well, there is a, a huge lack of inspectors that is overseeing this pipeline infrastructure and um, not very significant regulations requiring monitoring and reporting. And finally, there are many, many ways that pi pipelines can be uh, compromised um, and almost half of them have nothing to do with technology. Uh, one of the most frequent causes is excavation. People digging around pipelines, not knowing that they are, and causing a rupture. Uh, natural forces, um, trees, uh, floods, and, and also um, I basically, uh, and this is something that they found in the more, more recently built pipelines, uh, in uh, construction that is not to the highest standards, uh, wells that are not uh, um, complete or, or solid enough. This is what is being seen in terms of the average number of uh, incidents related to uh, um, pipeline spills. And uh, as you can see, there was a declining incidence uh, until 2010. Um, we obviously don't know what's been happening more recently, but that is dramatic. Basically, the number of annual incidents is more in 2010 than it was in the 1940s. That's very significant. So what have we seen that confirms the fact that pipelines are unsafe? The Kalamazoo River spill uh, in 2009. Um, this was a crude oil, uh, uh, tar sand spill. And as you can see, the quantity uh, is huge. 843,000 gallons. The cleanup has been going on since then. It uh, has uh, cost up to now over $2 billion, and there is still oil in the river. 
North Dakota in 2013. Uh, this is a, a, a prime example of a leak that went undetected for some unknown period of time until a farmer working in his fields actually smelled the oil and found out that um, seven football fields worth of oil had spilled. This is one of the largest spills in state history, North Dakota state history. And it was the field was contaminated to a depth of 30 feet. And more recently, Santa Barbara, California. Uh, many of you may remember this spill. Uh, it was a pipeline that went along the southern coastline of Santa Barbara County uh, near a state beach. Uh, again, the spill went undetected for a significant period of time. Uh, spilled oil passed through a storm drain into the ocean. Uh, the cost of the cleanup is significant. This was a pipeline that was using technology to try and determine if there was a problem with the integrity of the pipeline. That piece of technology is called a smart pig. And it is one of the technologies that Pilgrim has cited as the reason why they, their pipeline would never have a spill problem. So why didn't the smart pig detect the problem with the Santa Barbara uh, pipeline before uh, it ruptured? Um, the probability is that there was either human error in a reading of the uh, data that was coming from the smart pig, uh, or the smart pig just was not effective in detecting corrosion. Um, and this just is an example of how the touting of technology does not necessarily avoid the disaster that can be the result of a pipeline failure. So what are we looking for here um, in the Hudson Valley? What are the resources that, that would be put at risk if Pilgrim Pipeline were constructed? The pipelines, um, as mapped out by the company, would cross the Hudson River twice, uh, the Walkill, Catskill, Moodna, Roundout, and Asopus rivers and creeks, and every other major tributary to the Hudson River. Uh, in addition, the sensitive resources that the pipeline would potentially impact are 232 regulated streams um, with, by the main stem of the pipeline and another 25 uh, uh, water resources uh, being crossed by laterals. Um, the pipelines will cross 105 designated 100-year floodplains and 10 floodways. It will result in permanent impacts to 148 acres of forest causing fra fragmentation and would cross 296 wetlands and would also pass through 5.8 miles of prime far farmland and 7.6 miles of farmland of statewide importance. Finally, it will pass through, it would pass through 12.59 miles of state designated coastal zone. Uh, it has the potential to impact a minimum of 27 state and federally listed endangered species that potentially inhabit the areas that are going to be impacted. And as was referenced previously, there are many working farms adjacent to the throughway that are either going to be in the path of the pipeline or are going to be impacted by uh, access roads that the company will need to build in order to um, maintain the pipeline. Uh, in addition, and this is obviously of extreme concern to residents of both the six counties in New Jersey, I mean in New York and the counties in New Jersey that are going to see the impacts from this pipeline. It is the uh, drinking water supplies that are uh, supplied by um, aquifers, wells, aqueducts that are all going to be potentially um, in the path of this pipeline. <clears throat> there are 100,000 people that draw their water from the Hudson River. Uh, and the towns there are listed and they are both so on both sides of the Hudson. 
uh, Poughkeepsie and Rhinebeck uh, and Hyde Park on one side and Wade and Port Union and Highland on the other. Um, in addition, the Ramapo River watershed and aquifer supplies public water for about 3 million people in New York and New Jersey, um, including Tuxedo, Harriman, Sloatsburg, and Northern New Jersey. The Cascale and Delaware aqueducts, which supply drinking water to 9 million New Yorkers, will be crossed by this pipeline. Uh, and in addition, there are other um, sensitive aquifers that it will cross that supply uh, a drinking water to a significant number of people in northern New Jersey. Um, this pipeline on the small scale will threaten sources of drinking water from municipal wells and other smaller vulnerable aquifers. Pipeline construction impacts is a very, very significant concern. So there are impacts associated with the operation of the pipeline, which include the potential for spills. Um, but the construction impacts are significant. Uh, the pipelines will be constructed in a moving assembly line, cutting a swath through the valley 100 feet wide as the area is clear cut and graded, and a six foot by six foot trench is dug and blasted. If built, the pipeline will require a 50 foot wide permanently cleared right of way, as well as above ground infrastructure as was mentioned previously. Uh, the impacts on homeowners uh, who are not only in the path of the pipeline, but are adjacent to the pipeline are clear uh, with respect to construction. There is going to be significant blasting um, of exposed and shallow bedrock in various places along the path of the pipeline. Uh, in addition, the noise of the construction um, which is not going to just be limited to construction, but is also going to have impacts post-construction, uh, for instance, to uh, residential areas in the city of Kingston, where there is going to be a pump station within 200 feet uh, of those residential areas. Uh, as we mentioned, there is going to be construction across key water bodies. Uh, and in, in some cases, it will be tunneling under the water bodies. In others, it will be digging straight through the water bodies. Uh, wetland disturbance, stormwater impacts. Construction has the potential to have a huge stormwater impact because of vegetation removal, which then uh, the vegetation has been stabilizing uh, the um, sediment, and that now become, can become mobilized. Uh, sensitive aquifers, destruction of habitat, and destruction of um, forest and, as we mentioned, uh, soils and bedrock. Other community costs and impacts, um, and the list is a long one. This only uh, attempts to touch on a few. Uh, I did want to mention that Pilgrim uh, candidly admits that uh, the pipeline will abut or cross through portions of several environmental justice communities, um, who are communities that typically see more impact from environmental insults than other communities. Uh, condemnation. The Pilgrim identifies a minimum of 168 properties that could be subject to taking, uh, uh, being taken by Pilgrim uh, if they are unwilling to uh, come to an agreement with Pilgrim. Uh, to allow the construction of the pipeline. Uh, first responder preparedness costs uh, are obvious and but frequently um, not identified uh, because they are to some extent hidden. Uh, no one thinks about them until uh, all of a sudden first responders say, hey, we're not ready for this. We have no idea how to respond to a pipeline spill. Um, homeowners insurance premiums. Uh, this has been seen in other areas. Pipelines do not increase your property value. Uh, spill cleanup costs and damages. Uh, if, in fact, uh, there is not adequate insurance um, on the part of the uh, pipeline company, um, those costs, at least initially, can fall to local communities. And um, in terms of 
what we're looking at, uh, if a pump station fails, petroleum would be spilled at a rate of 8,500 barrels per hour. It would not take very long for that to cause a significant spill and uh, significant cleanup costs and damages. Finally, impact on property values. Um, and again, this is uh, not surprising. Um, but the thing that is frequently forgotten is that lower property values will impact property tax revenue for individual towns. Um, okay. Um, when Pilgrim says that pipelines would be safer, and this is another claim they, another one of the big claims they make, um, the pipelines would be safer than other modes of transport and that it would reduce the risks of spills. And this is a claim that Kate's already shown is dubious at best. Um, the companies implying that the pipeline is going to replace other modes of crude oil transport. And there is um, a bit of confusion about this in the community that I've run into. A lot of people or people have, have um, you know, thought that um, if this pipeline is constructed, there would be no more bomb trains running through their neighborhoods. Um, and this is, this is just not true. Um, if there is a global demand for it, um, you know, all modes of transport would be used. Um, Pilgrim has not designed the pipelines to be big enough to end both uh, uh, rail and barge transport. And the bomb trains traveling south um, through New York um, are on their way to refineries in Philadelphia. Philadelphia Energy Solution, uh, Solutions, uh, PS, is the largest East Coast refinery and the lar single largest consumer of back and crude oil in the country and it will not be served by this pipeline. Um, so the, the trains that, um, that we see running along the river line will continue to run along the river line. Uh, thirdly, no one can require that rail or vessel transport um, be moved to the pipelines. It's going to depend upon the choices that industry makes, which no one can predict. Now, the industry does like to maintain flexibility different modes of transport have different advantages. Um, and I'll just give you one example. You know, um, shippers don't necessarily want um, pipelines. The contracts for pipelines are typically 10 to 15 years long. And, and um, they don't, shippers don't always want to enter into those contracts in case the market changes. And an advantage of rail and barge is the contracts can be much shorter, one to two years. Um, so as uh, the American Petroleum Institute analyst, Robin Rorick said, when we look at the modes of transportation, our industry, the oil and gas industry, we take an all of the above approach. The bottom line is that adding another mode of transport is going to increase the risk of spill or other accident in New York. Um, and we could actually see uh, a growth in crude by rail uh, traffic to Albany with both barge and pipelines, um, pipelines options available at the Port of Albany. So we can actually see a growth in rail transport in, in, in that part of New York. So Pilgrim claims that, also claims their pipelines will meet New Yorkers needs for a more reliable fuel supply. Um, so we should start with the basic question of need. Um, are New Yorkers, are we demanding more, more refined products made from crude oil? Um, the trend is actually going steadily going in the opposite direction. Demand for products made from crude oil have been declining in U.S. markets, and this includes New York markets. And the reason for this decline is that we're becoming more and more efficient and we're reducing our dependence on fossil fuels. This trend is going to continue as, as, New, York, as New York continues to move aggressively to meet its climate goals, and we'll discuss, discuss those shortly. The important point is that real energy security is about reducing our fossil fuel independence through improved efficiency and through investments in local renewable resources. 
Will the pipelines mean cheaper fuel for New Yorkers? No. These crude oil and ref refined products, these are global commodities. Their prices are determined by existing and futures markets. We have to recognize that this project is not about New York and serving New Yorkers. We are would be but a little link in the global distribution chain. Now that Congress has lifted the export ban, Pilgrim pipelines could enable more crude oil from the back and region of North Dakota and Canada to be exported to the world market. It's important to keep in mind that New York Harbor is the third largest petroleum product, I'm sorry, the largest petroleum products hub in the Northeast with the capacity to store over 75 million barrels of petroleum products. We can all, we are all, as you can see from the graph, um, over the last decade, we have been exporting more and more refined products in the U.S. and we are not, from the U.S. and we are now actually a net exporter. So the question we have to ask is do our communities benefit from these pipelines? And the answer is we don't. The oil industry benefits. Now Pilgrim has claimed that its pipeline project, ironically, will be good for climate. This, on the, this is something that my 12-year-old children recognize as, as really quite ridiculous. More Oil is trans more oil transported will encourage more fossil fuel extraction, accelerating climate change. The Obama administration just rejected the Keystone XL pipeline precisely because of its effects on climate change. As the State Department said in its decision, a decision to approve this pro proposed project would undermine U.S. objectives on climate change. It could call into question internationally the broader efforts of the United States to transition to less polluting forms of energy and would raise doubts about the U.S. resolve to do so. The Pilgrim Pipelines project is no different. And it actually goes completely contrary to New York's vision of its energy future. The Cuomo administration is, has gone on record as saying that he wants New York to be a national leader and a model in the fight against climate change. New York has set pretty aggressive targets to reduce carbon emissions um, by its New York energy plan has uh, set the longer term goal of an 80% reduction by 2050 and an interim goal of a 40% reduction by 2030 below 1990 levels. Um, we Recently, the Cuomo administration, well, in the same energy plan, has also committed to achieving 50% um, uh, of our electricity generation from renewable sources, and has committed to phasing out coal plants by 2020, has implemented the Reforming the Energy Vision Initiative, which is a, a groundbreaking initiative that is being closely watched around the country to transition to a more locally based clean energy economy. Um, the state is investing, it's not on this list here, we've dropped it off accidentally, but the state has been heavily investing in um, electric car infrastructure, in energy efficiency and alternative energy. So it is the state, as, as, as we said, this goes completely against state energy goals. But local communities also see this pipeline as offering no benefits to them, only risks. In the year before uh, the P Pilgrim Pipeline Company uh, submitted a permit application for the project, 18 New York communities had already passed resolutions of opposition against the project. So where are we? 
Um, one of the things that uh, uh, is very distinctive about the process by which this proposal that Pilgrim Pipelines LLC has made is that there is no federal agency uh, like FERC, the Federal uh, Energy Regulatory Commission, um, that oversees the permitting of oil pipelines in New York State or anywhere else in the country. They are exempt. And so this is very different from what we have seen with gas pipeline permitting, uh, with which we've become all too familiar in New York, where there is a federal agency. Uh, although we might not think that they are doing a very good job, they are, in fact, running, uh, uh, overseeing the siting and permitting process. We do not have that agency here. Um, and this is a project, because of its scope, um, both geographically and because of the number of vital resources that are going to be impacted, that requires approvals and permits from a huge number of agencies, both federal, state, I mean, federal, state, county, town, and village, um, and all of whom are known as involved agencies because the, a permit is required from them or an approval in order for this project to move forward. Uh, and so it is uh, a, a distinct challenge, particularly for the public, uh, but even for these involved agencies to understand what the process is uh, going forward and what role they can play. Um, the one common denominator that does is clear is that before any permits or approvals can be granted, there has to be a full environmental review of the project's environmental impacts potential environmental impacts. And this is required by both state and federal law, the state law being seeker. Um, so with the filing of the first permit application that uh, Pilgrim made in August, although it came known to us not until November, uh, with the Thruway Authority, uh, that triggered the beginning of the seeker process. Uh, as many of you may be familiar, uh, that the first step in the seeker process is to determine which of the involved agencies is going to oversee the environmental review process. Um, on when Thruway Authority received Pilgrim's uh, application, they, uh, or several months afterwards, they sent a letter to all of the involved agencies and said, we think we should be <clears throat> the lead agency. Um, and remarkably, um, many, many involved agencies disagreed with them and weighed in to make that very clear. Uh, and their concerns uh, fell into a number of different areas, but not the least of which is the Thruway Authority has a financial stake in the project moving forward because it will get fees for the lease of its right of way. Uh, and many felt it did not have any environmental expertise or sensitivity that would make it the appropriate agency. Um, just to continue what the overview of the process is, uh, once a lead agency is designated, which has not occurred yet, um, then there is the lead agency determines whether or not a full environmental review and the preparation of a draft environmental impact statement is required. Uh, at this point, uh, I think everybody agrees that it is. Um, after that, and this is the really the first opportunity that the public has to get involved, is called scoping. And this is essentially identifying what environmental impacts should be studied in the DEIS, uh, what impact, what alternatives, what mitigation should be discussed. It's essentially the scope of the DEIS is the table of contents for the DEIS. Uh, and there will be a release of a draft scope by the lead agency once the lead agency is identified. And then there will be uh, a brief opportunity for uh, not only involved agencies, but the public to weigh in on um, things that have been missed that are very important, particularly local impacts. After scoping, uh, the applicant is the one who prepares the draft environmental impact statement. 
that is reviewed by the lead agency. And if it's determined sufficient for release for public review, then there is an opportunity again for the public um, to review and comment. Uh, and one aspect of this review, which I did not list here, is that if there is a significant amount of public interest and concern about a project, then uh, the lead agency can decide to hold what is called a seeker public hearing. And this can be a very, very significant opportunity for many members of involved agencies and the public to uh, be able to come and testify, submit testimony before the agency before there is any finalizing of the environmental impact statement um, and any decision making by involved agencies. Uh, and then finally, the, uh, involved, the lead agency is responsible for finalizing the FEIS and for issuing findings. Um, the findings, essentially based on the DEIS, um, must enable the lead agency to certify that uh, that among all the reasonable alternatives, the action that is chosen is the one that avoids or minimizes adv adverse environmental impacts to the maximum extent practicable. It is because DEC could not make that certification with respect to fracking in New York State that fracking in New York State is now banned. Uh, as I indicated, we did get a pilgrim application that was submitted to the Thruway Authority for a use and occupancy, a permit um, to get access to the Thruway right-of-way. Uh, Thruway Authority then indicated it wanted to be lead agency and um, municipalities broadly reacted. 29 uh, counties, towns, and villages uh, wrote and denied their consent to Thruway Authority, urged DEC to serve in that capacity. Um, DEC's response, unfortunately, was to recommend that DEC be a co-lead agency with Thruway. Uh, this was equally unacceptable to a number of towns that have already uh, indicated that their lack of consent to that proposal, including the city of Kingston and the town of Rosendale. Um, the town of New Paltz has now formally asked the uh, DEC commissioner to decide this lead agency dispute. Once the lead agency dispute is decided, uh, then we will see the release of a draft scope. And um, the, the opportunity for the public to comment on the draft scope is extremely important one to take advantage of. Uh, given that we are likely to not get a significant amount of time to comment. It's really important for uh, individuals and um, towns to uh, begin to gather information about impacts that concern you uh, so that they can be put into comments on the scope once you get it. It's particularly important to identify local impacts. Um, I am not going to go through this slide uh, to a great extent uh, because of shortness of time, but certainly if people have questions about it, I'd be happy to answer them. Uh, there is a separate application process uh, once the environmental review is complete with respect to Pilgrim getting access to the thruway right-of-way. The one thing to uh, highlight here is it's not only a New York State decision. The Federal Highway Administration has to also agree um, that this is appropriate. And there is a, an agreement which is uh, between the Federal Highway Administration and New York State DOT that um, in the, an ordinary uh, situation, only communications facilities should be allowed to run up and down the thruway. And so in order for this crude oil pipeline to run on up and down the thruway, um, they would need to be able to get an exception to the agreement from both the Federal Highway Administration and New York State DOT. Uh, this is also a very important process for the public to find uh, ways to weigh in on. Um, and now we would like to go over actions. OK, there are a number of things that you can do. Um, first, become involved in the environmental re review process and encourage your elected representatives to be involved as well. Submit comments on the scope 
of that review, as Kate had pointed out, and what impacts and alternatives must be considered, including climate impacts. It's very important that, and we know best, the local resources that are at risk in our communities. We, we can, and we really need to bring these to the attention of the, of the DEC and lead, hopefully, who will hopefully be our lead agency or whoever the lead agency is. Um, write to the governor and the New York State Thruway Authority and Department of Transportation and urge them to deny Pilgrim the ability to use the thruway right of way for their pipelines. Work in your community to introduce and pass county and local municipal resolutions opposing P Pilgrim Pipeline and a zoning ordinance prohibiting oil pipelines that don't bring products or services to town residents. Um, in my town, the town of Rosendale, we, we already have an ordinance in place that, um, that prohibits uh, this pipeline. Now, town resolutions of opposition can, can really make a difference. They're very worth doing. First of all, they can influence the decisions of the Thruway Authority, Department of Transportation, and other regula regulators about granting or denying access to the Thruway right of way. They can also impact decisions that Pilgrim makes about its route selection. They can result in a more comprehensive environmental review process being required by state and federal regulators. And they can send a message to investors in the pipeline that this is not a good capital investment for them. We're going to fight it. Without investors, the Pilgrim Pipelines project may fail to move forward. So we want to thank you for joining us and just draw your attention to some resources um, here we have, oh, I'm sorry, there's one other action you can do, which is to join the Coalition Against the Pilgrim Pipelines email list and weekly phone calls to join this grassroots opposition. Okay, and they are, of course, one of our resources. Um, and the resources are listed here, um, Stop Pilgrim Pipeline. Riverkeeper, Citizens for Local Power, um, and we thank you very much. Thank you. Please do reach out to us with questions uh, if you have them. Thank you.